Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, we are uh, here for our first of three in a series of sessions related to behavior management in our classrooms, and we're really excited to have Karen King with us this morning. You may have seen uh, Karen at some of our previous uh, PD events in our summer summit, as well as the Behavior Institute and many others across the state. She has been actively engaged in this work for a very long time, and we are very excited to have her with us this morning. Uh, we appreciate all of you being here as well, and we are excited to learn more about uh, classroom management Again, today in our first series, our next one is about non-compliance, which is coming up next Wednesday, April 24th from 10 to 11. And then our final session on de-escalation, which will come the Tuesday after that, April 30th from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, again, thank you for being here and welcome. Karen, thank you, Ronnie. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to um, share information with you. And as Ronnie said, I, I have spoken to your organization um, in prior um, state trainings and conferences, um, also CCBD, CEC. Um, good morning, Katie. I'm glad that you're able to um, log on um, as we go through. And um and um, addition, what I want, I was talking to Cindy earlier this morning, and I really want to tailor this to meet your needs of what's currently going on um, with you, particular in your classroom. So if I like to utilize the chat um, box, or you can unmute and talk for a few seconds, but I do find that the chat box kind of keeps it moving. So that way we get in the content, but you're also welcome to unmute. But could you go ahead and quickly just put in what are your current needs with classroom management? What are your struggles with currently? I'll give you just a few minutes to put that into um, the chat box. And that way it gives me an idea of where to hit um, as I'm going through the PowerPoint, but can tailor it to meet your needs. I'll just add, don't be shy. We have a lot of folks on here who uh, who we know have reached out to us about this issue. So uh, feel free to jump those into the into the chat or or unmute yourself. We'd love to hear those. Please do. It just helps me to be able to address it or give ideas or resources as we go through. And I'll give you just a few minutes to do that. And I'm going to go ahead and post a sharing link for you to click on that will get you to the PowerPoint along with some other resources in a Google folder. Okay, so specifically one student um, maybe blowing up or being triggered and how it affects the others in the classroom. Mental health concerns, huge. And especially coming back from COVID over the years. And in addition, I would even say um, with the mental health, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is just how things are set up and to get medication <laughs> um, and to go through that. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Disruption in classroom, okay, and across the schools. Perfect. And some we will touch on today, some maybe um, through our non-compliance, and then the third one with the de-escalation. Hopefully it will build upon each other as we go through to be able to provide resources and ideas um, as we look. If you think of anything, um, Ronnie and or Cindy, if you can monitor the chat, if somebody has a question, that would be awesome to let me know. But I'm going to go ahead and get started because we just have an hour um, as we move through here. So 
All right, so you today is classroom management technique. So we're gonna look at going back to the basics, which is always a good thing for us to do when we're struggling, um, when we're having issues in the classroom. I am a teacher um, of 30, one years now had to count um, and think through that. Um, I am currently um, retired. However, I have two teenage boys in my home. So I feel like I do this on a daily basis um, as we go through. So um, a 14 year old and a 16 year old um, as we go through. So hopefully I can be able to provide some other um, tips and resources. Real quick, um, today's agenda, if you wanted to use your phone, you can use your phone to get the QR code to um, the Google folder. If not, it's in the chat. And you're going to be looking for the PDF that has that welcome sign on there. Um, and that is your handout for today as we go through. And if we have other people who log on after, we will need to repost that, um, that link. Um, just as we go through. So just checking to see where everybody is. Um, and we're going to do a quick little stress test. If we would have done this on me um, on Friday, that um, my stress level was to here. Uh, but today it is much better. Again, the sun has been out Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So it's definitely helping. But on the next slide, you're going to look at identical, identical um, dolphins jumping out of the water. And I love to be able to do this because it's always fun to look for the differences. Um, a closely monitored scientific study of a group of scientists revealed that in spite of the fact of the dolphins being identical, a person under stress would find the difference in the two dolphins. Um, the number of differences observed matches closely to the amount of stress that you are currently feeling. So we're going to take a quick look <laughs> as we go through. Do you see the difference? So where's your stress level? Um, and a lot of our stress level is being able to recognize if we are under stress. So today we'll be looking at that. We'll be um, talking about how can we, when we are stressed and things are out of control, whether it's for us, for our students, our students that it spills over to us and vice versa. But we're going to look at what are the basics that we need to go back, even though it is April, we still may need to go back and make sure that we're doing what we know, in fact, what research says are best practices in our classroom. So um, our roadmap today, we'll just look at behaviors, and then we'll talk about organization of your classroom rules, uh, rewards and consequences. We'll quickly um, touch on that. You'll have lots of resources. Um, just that generic classroom management, do you have these things in place? And then how much is the relationship that um, is occurring in your classroom with your students. Sometimes, and I wish that we could add, Cindy and I were talking about this earlier, this is where my stress level was. I said I had to do a complete update on my computer, was um, doing filing taxes. <laughs> um, I had done all my taxes prior to spring break, and then I go back in to um, take care of that. And, um, lost most of half of it. So I entered it like three times. So my stress level based on sometimes technology is supposed to be there to help us. Okay. <laughs> You're so funny on don't have a cow, Ronnie. Uh, that's funny. Uh, but again, as we go through, we are hit in every direction. So whether it's from your administration, whether it's from KDE, whether it's from parents and or students or other teachers and our own families, we are always having to manage all of these different inputs. So we have to recognize when our stress level gets high, what we need to do in order to bring it back down and get in control of things. And we as teachers like to have control. So what do you need to do to reorganize for your school or home? What are some things that have helped you in the past to reorganize when you're stressed? 
real quickly, you can either unmute or you can put it into the chat box. What are some things that you have redone, whether it's in the classroom, school, or at home, when you're stressed, that helps you reorganize? I'll give you just a few moments. Okay, definitely finding the planner tool for you so you know um, what's coming, what do you need to do. Definitely helps lower that. What else? Personally, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this probably on the last um, section um, under de-escalation um, with anger management, but refocus on the task, organizing what helps soothe you, turning off uh, maybe your phone where you don't hear it ding all the time. Um, maybe to be able to go outside, that was a huge thing for, for myself in order to, um, refocus on the task at hand is taking a break and knowing when to, and if we as adults recognize this, but sometimes don't utilize it, we need to start utilizing it more, but we also need to teach this to some of our kids, um, Sometimes we don't realize their level of stress or their triggers, and we need to start teaching this to them. Um, you have middle school and high school students, and this is the one thing I'm tutoring a, a particular girl um, currently, and I'm really trying to go back and teach her different strategies as far as writing down, um, having a calendar, maybe putting um, reminders in her phone. These are all that executive functioning, but also for her to realize what works for her and then what her stress level is. So we're really trying to work on that. Um, I think it's huge for us. I said, we're gonna go back to the basic. Sometimes by April, we have fallen off from everything that we started off at the beginning of the school year. Um, I always hear from my student, from my students, from my own kids um, about their teachers. And um, sometimes they'll come in and go, oh my gosh, she was in a really bad mood. Um, or um, this happened to my teacher. What do you think we should do? So with some of that in perspective, I do see and hear from my own kids. And I know from when I was a teacher too, our mood and our stress depends on how well we organize our classroom and we follow through with our rules and consequences and what we said at the beginning. So we're gonna keep on looking at some behavior as we go through. Characteristics of a well-managed classroom. Students are deeply involved in the work. And so I'll give you a couple of other resources that will be um, either links or um, files into the Google folder. But if your kids aren't involved into that, then they are going to be bored and they are gonna get into trouble. So really having kids involved um, in the work that you're currently doing. Um, making it meaningful to them. Why do they need to do it? There's tons of different strategies of how to get students engaged. And I'll touch on those. If not, we'll have some resources. Students know what is expected of them. And if they do, then they typically are more successful. If you're not being, um, what's the word I want to say? having your routines in place, um, teaching, um, Canvas. Okay, Canvas is another one. My kids, um, certain things might be listed on Canvas, but the teacher may or may not um, always update that. So trying to make sure they can't hit a target if they don't know what is due or what is coming or what project or what needs to be done. So students need to know exactly what their target is. Sometimes we think it's April, they should know, but again, we need to make sure that we're still doing what we're
supposed to be doing at the beginning of the school year. Um, there's relatively little wasted time in confusion and or disruption. And if there is, we need to make it the bare minimal. And we'll talk about that. But little wasted time means that we have an agenda. We know what our daily schedule looks like, that we're getting the kids involved, that we're staying on schedule, and we're paying attention to the time. OK, and we adjust as we need. But we'll talk about downtime here in a little bit with kids with um, behavioral issues. Um, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? And, and we'll look at that. Um, the climate of the classroom is work oriented, but relaxed and pleasant. So, again, think about your own work environment when you come into a classroom or come into work. Uh, do you want to be greeted by your boss or do you want to be hit on where's your lesson plans? Where is um, this IEP paperwork? Um, do you have the goals? Where are your test scores? Any of that. You don't want to be hit with that at the beginning. Even though it's on our work um, oriented daily agenda, we definitely want to greet them. How was your evening? What's going on? And making it a relaxed place, but still having those expectations. A well-managed classroom is um, a task-oriented environment. So we know exactly where we need to go, that you have a roadmap. Um, it's predictable that the kids know the routine. Um, and you have to think about the days that you change it up or if it's really changed since the beginning and is ready and waiting for students. So sometimes if we're not prepared for them, then our day won't go as smooth. So really making sure that our lesson plans are done, that we have ways to get kids engaged into the lesson and that we have a schedule out and that we're moving through that at a good pace. Dealing with students today and behavior, um, with students' behavior in the classroom today, it's changed and it keeps changing. It's changed even more since COVID. Um, and this is a picture of my youngest um, during COVID having to do work at home. And that was a big adjustment. And um, my youngest actually has been diagnosed with dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, anxiety, and a little sensory, and you can sprinkle a little anxiety on top of that. But, um, you know, we've definitely had to look at how much did COVID affect that, um, where he wasn't in the classroom, and especially going back into the classroom. So we do know that the mental health component of that for many kids, it's a struggle, and it's a struggle for us as teachers. The changing family here, um, in the last two decades, there's been a 200% growth in single parent household. I'm going to even say that that's going to go more since COVID and we'll go back and relook at this, but the number of moms um, leaving home for work, honestly, I think it's now maybe that they're not even raised by some of their uh, biological mom and dad, it's a lot more grandparents nowadays actually raising and they don't have the energy or strength to follow through with teenage kids. Um, nearly one in four children are living below poverty. More than half of all American children will witness their parents divorce or nowadays um, that's still a current trend. But again, most a lot of kids are being raised by their, their um, grandparents and or in foster care. Um, in the last 10 years, the estimated number of child abuse victims has risen. Um, and again, this is another one. Um, over um, 8,000 TV murders to um, 100,000 acts of violence. Again, this is before finishing elementary, and this is with social media. So... It's not an easy time to work with children and youth. Um, the positive and negative role models available to the child have a huge impact. That exposure to violence, the emotional and physical um, health of them. And since COVID, that mental health has grown even more. And then being able to even get in to get an evaluation 
or med change is huge. In addition to that, just getting prescriptions is also, an, it's not an easy um, fit to be able to do that. I know just from getting my own child's medication with insurance um, changing, um, also the shortages, and then also with the requirements that they can only send in two, um, two prescriptions per each time, but then every six months you have to do a follow-up um, with that. So just being able to keep up with it. And then when you call to do the refill, you actually have to call and speak to somebody. You can't automatically just give the prescription number. So I've been there to say, oh, this parent hasn't filled this prescription. This kid is struggling. What are we gonna do? It takes a lot of work to stay on top of the medication and getting it filled and making sure about the shortage and um, all of that. So keep that in mind. And I know I had to get pre-authorization for my own child. And with being that behavior specialist, I got get some to- grub, you know, man. Get some grub. Do what? Oh, Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure. But uh, with my own particular child, I know like I had to get pre-authorization for a particular stimulant for him that worked much better than others, especially for his academic performance um, versus others. But the insurance kept telling us that we had to do another stimulant um, and not the one that worked. And this occurred even after three years of taking the original prescription, which was extremely frustrating. But I did have a really good doctor who worked with me and we were able to do that. But some parents, they don't have that. And so kids might not be medicated in the correct form. And we see that spill over even in the classroom. Um, when can we trace um, out of control behaviors to a variety of factors? Uh, so we can trace it. We can look at the physical and emotional climate of the child's home and or neighborhood and or friends as we look at that. The amount of stability and consistency in the child's family, which we all know typically is not there even with the best of the best families. Um, Parenting styles, are they young? Are they being raised by really young parents? Are they being raised by possibly their grandparents? Um, so those parenting styles there may affect that. And the power and influence appears in a child's life. So those friends that they run around with, um, it's huge. And what kids typically might not do, they might do if the peers are definitely um, encouraging them, even in our normal peers. Um, this is a really good video. I'm only going to show just a small little fraction of it to get us in a different mindset. Um, and when we're thinking about behavior in the classroom and how we can um, shift our thinking a little bit. Young children are being suspended and expelled from school at alarming rates. Preschool children are suspended three times more than kindergarten through 12th grades combined. In Illinois, 40% of child care centers reported suspending infants and toddlers. Yes, those are children who have not yet turned three years old. African-American children are only 19% of the preschool population, but comprise nearly half of all suspensions. You may be wondering, what can these kids possibly be doing to be suspended and kicked out of school so young? Surprisingly, many of them are engaging in typical childlike behaviors. I was one of those children. From the time I entered school, 
I was suspended at least seven times a year. <laughs> I was suspended for things like digging a hole in the playground to see if China was really on the other side of the earth. For that, I was labeled destructive. After a unit on maps, I climbed on top of the school auditorium so I could get a bird's eye view. And after the fire department and police department got me down, I was suspended. And for that, I was labeled incorrigible. There was this one time I took all the baby doll's heads, arms and legs off. I just wanted to see how the body parts fit together. But for that, I was labeled a demon. They actually told my parents I exhibited demon-like behaviors. Then there, there, there was this one time I snuck into the boys' bathroom. I wanted to see how they got to pee standing up. <laughs> but for that, I was labeled sexually perverted. Now these are all childlike behaviors, albeit from a very curious child, but childlike nonetheless. Let's look at behaviors. What is it that children do when they get upset or they're deemed out of control? They scream, cry, hit, cuss, fight, throw things. That's because they're kids. Kids are going to be kids. They don't have the capacity to handle such intense emotions. Let's take a look at what adults do when they get upset. Kick, scream, cry, fight, cuss, throw things. The list is exactly the same. And while we can expect kids to be kids, as adults, what's our excuse? My friend Walter Gilliam says, suspensions are adult decisions. Suspensions are adult behaviors. But what if we change that behavior? What if we shift our thinking Focusing on the behavior of adults rather than focusing on the behavior of children. What if my teachers would have seen me as a geologist rather than being destructive? What if they would have seen me as a scientist rather than being a demon or a future doctor interested in anatomy? rather than seeing me as sexually perverted. The key to managing the difficult behaviors of children is to manage our own behavior as adults. How many times have you seen an adult scold a child for screaming while also screaming? <laughs> right? Or how many times have you seen them scold a child for hitting while also hitting? Don't you dare hit your sister again. Or sometimes we even exclude children for excluding children. Oh, you don't wanna to play together? Just go to your rooms. The behavior that we give the most attention to is the behavior that we are promoting. Okay, so real quick, I love that video. I love everything she has to say. Again, it's about a 12 minute video. <laughs> you should be able to get to the link um, in the, hold on just a second. Let me make it in the um, note section. But um, again, I think it is us having to look at behavior a little differently, not to always see the bad, but to see. Um, okay, if they like to argue, and we'll be talking about noncompliance next week, <clears throat> but if they like to truly argue, and then maybe that they're going to be um, a, a good lawyer, right, as we go through. So we're going to begin to look at behavior a little differently. We'll talk about the function of it as we go through, but we have to talk about that classroom management um, in general. So what can we control? Um what we do when the students are with us. So when you have them during your day, positive behavioral support, emphasis on function and purpose, which is what we were just talking about of the behavior, um, focusing on teaching new and or replacement behaviors for the students. And we'll talk about that as we see that misbehavior occur. What's the function of it? Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they disrupting, disrupting the classroom? 
um, change the adult behaviors first um, and the student's behavior second. So when you get frustrated and when that kid demonstrates it, I kind of, one of my favorite things to do is to, um, if I can go back in life and wanted a new career, it would be like an FBI profiler. Um, I like to see how students respond to different things that we give to them and how the adults act first. So keeping that in mind, we'll look at the function and we'll talk a little bit about that, but also redesigning learning and teaching environments. So making sure that we have created um, that learning environment where they come in, they feel safe, um, it's clean, it's organized, um, and we'll talk about the physical environment um, as we look at this too. A study reviewing student learning looked at 11,000 pieces of research that spanned over 50 years. It determined and ranked 28 factors that influence student, student learning. And the most impor important factor is classroom management. So um, as we go through and we're looking at classroom management, some things that we already know, punitive consequences are not enough. Um, and we're limited to what we can do. And there's probably nothing we can do in the classroom and or as a school administrator that is hard enough or bad enough than what some of our kids have experienced prior. So keep that in mind. Row-bound um, power is not enough. Um, sometimes the administrator walking in does not... Um, effect or whether it's a school resource officer or law enforcement does not stop the behaviors that typically would scare some of us into, oh, I see a cop like driving down the road. If I see a cop car or I even see a car, I quickly let off of um, the gas because I'm typically may speed a little bit, but I also don't want a ticket. So that row bound um, power is not enough there. Wishing and hoping is not enough. Um, that I hope that they move. Maybe they'll be sick today. They won't come. Um, any one of those things. Um, some of our most intense kiddos show up every single day. Um, there are no simple solutions. And so knowing that is huge. It is a combination of a lot of different things and there's no magic bullets. But some things we do know, we can look at our data. We can see when behavior occurs and we can be able to address that as we go through. So I highly recommend maybe you look at your own classroom data and then possibly look at um, your school. I want you to real quickly just jot down um, the answer to these questions. Um, what month does most behavior occur in school? What day of the week? What time of day? And where does the majority of office behavior occur? So meaning when an office referral happens, where does it occur? Does it occur on the bus? Um, transition, cafeteria, gym, or the classroom. So real quickly, just jot those down. And then I'm going to ask everybody, and you can just answer one at a time. What month does most behavior occur? Go ahead and type that into the chat. I'll give just a couple of more minutes or seconds, actually not minutes. There's a new batch. So a new set of behaviors that come in. That's probably true. It, it'll be very interesting to look at your data to see 
is it even um, or does it occur mostly at the beginning of the month, the middle of the month, the end of the month? So you can kind of go through and look at it. But one of the things, if you can predict it, we could prevent it. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through. I see some of you have said, um, August, I'll share with you in a moment the answers, but let's go ahead and do the next one. What day of the week do you think it occurs on? So just type in just a couple of you to type that in. Okay, Monday. Some of us feel like Monday's a rough day. Um, what time of the day? So eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, or the end of the day, three o'clock. And where does the majority of the office behavior occur? Transition, the bus, um, classroom specials, you know. Thank you all for participating. All right, real quick, let's take a look. Um, this is um, la on last year's current data, March and November. Wednesday, most people on hump day, you would think they're happy, but I guess um, maybe we slack a little bit more, but look at the time of day, one o'clock after lunch, always um, an issue there. And uh, most of the office referrals um, come from the classroom as opposed to bus and or transition or hallways. So, what we need to do with this information, and you need to do this for your own particular, especially since Ronnie just mentioned that um, a lot of yours fluctuates. Um, so you really want to hone in on your particular data to say, maybe it's the first of the month, every month. Maybe it's the middle of the month um, when you get a new set of kids um, to come in. Look at that look at the time of day, um, and then you need to address that behaviorally speaking to prevent it. So with this current information that we have, I know that with my current behavior um, classroom plan, I might need to do a lot more reinforcement or a special reinforcement in March. I'm also going to have to go back and do reteaching prior to March and maybe November. Um, I may need to really provide a lot more structure on Wednesday, maybe also, and I'm making up the hour, but maybe during fifth hour um, I, at one o'clock, I'm going to have to really have a, a tighter um, structure for those kiddos after lunch and be very structured with my uh, fifth period class as opposed to my second and third. So just knowing these type of things and knowing that the majority of them come from the classroom. Yours may not, but what you need to do is look at your behavior and then come up with when are they occurring the most and or the disruption and then being able to address that during that time. Examples of functions um, of behaviors in school that you get to see. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the function of behaviors, but these are the behaviors that you see. I yell and others look at me. So remember you said those disruptions that are occurring in the classroom. I fight and others listen to me. I get up and I wander around the room and people talk to me. I hit and I get things from other people. So whether it was my phone, whether it was a book, whatever it is, maybe it says toys, but I know y'all are doing middle and high school. Um, so think about these kiddos who are causing some of these disruptions. What are they currently doing? So another set, I cry when work gets too hard and the teacher takes um, tells me to take time out. Um, I throw a book during math class and the teacher will send me out of class. So I get out of it. 
I stand against the wall in PE so my classmates don't throw the ball at me if you're playing dodgeball or whatever it may be. But the main focus of this is to begin to look at, if we go back to our little TED Talk, <clears throat> what's the function of their behavior? What are they doing? So there are two function of behaviors for that disruption that you're seeing in the classroom. One is to obtain, to get something, and the other is to escape and to avoid. So when this occurs, we have to figure out another way for them to get the same function out of acceptable behavior. So I'm gonna use the escape and avoidance because I can talk about my youngest who has um, this uh, dyslexia and dysgraphia. When he gets an assignment that has a lot of words on it or he perceives is going to be too tough, he's not gonna cry immediately. He, he's probably not gonna throw a book, but this is what some kids do obviously to get out. But he's going to say he has a headache, he has to go to the bathroom, he knows what works. He's going to use something to get out of that work. Now, I have worked with his teachers and I had a colleague who said, I would hate to be your son's teacher. I went, don't say that. I have one of his teachers who loves me um, and she learned a lot and she went on from a regular ed teacher um, in fourth grade to be high school intervention teacher and um, loves doing it. But so anyway, I worked with her years ago because he would try to go to the bathroom, headache, see the nurse, whatever it was to get out of class. We started to um, implement a plan that he would only get to go to the bathroom. I think it was, we started off with three times um, I, then we moved it to two times in addition to whatever the classroom did. But what we also started to teach him is before he went, there was a delay and we had to ask a question to him about the work. Do you see this to be too hard? Um, is it too easy? Do you need help? And some other type question prompts to see why is he trying to get out of the work? Um, does he not understand it? Is he confused? But again, being able to do this, you have to begin to look at misbehavior a little different. So the disruption that is occurring, the yelling, the fighting, the hitting, why are they doing this? Are they trying to get something or are they trying to avoid something? So keep that in mind. And I really want you to write that down, put it on a post-it note and put it on your computer to say, what are they trying to get when the disruption occurs? What are they trying to tell me? The work's too hard. They're frustrated. They want attention. What is it that they're trying to get? And then we as adults, have to be able to give them that without them having the disruption. Does that make sense? It's a lot to go through, but I just want you to start thinking as misbehavior or disruption occurs in your classroom, why is it occurring? So here's some big ideas that also, if you can write this down and also put it on a post-it note and just stick it on your computer, big ideas. All behavior is learned. Behavior serves a function. So what's that function? The environment impacts the behavior. Skill deficits impact the behavior. So the kiddos that you all are getting, remember that TED Talk? They probably were the kiddos who were getting kicked out of preschool, um, getting suspended, um, getting all those office referrals at that time. Their skills may not be to where they need to be. And another thing, and we'll talk a lot about the team approach, especially next week with non-compliance, um, team approach is critical. Um, it's huge. And relationships matter. Can the kids come and tell you what's really going on? It's huge. 
Um, and I say that whether it's with your own kids or the kids in school, especially a lot of our kids who are receiving med, uh, medication, who have mental health, my youngest who is on meds, but his first year on medication for ADHD, it was like a dream miracle drug, okay? Like he went up 20 points when he was on it. It was wonderful for the first week, maybe two weeks, but then it was probably the second week. All of a sudden he couldn't sleep. He was wide awake. And my happy nine-year-old child, all of a sudden, he starts telling me, mom, my brain tells me to hurt myself, that I don't, that, and he's never, ever, ever shown any signs of depression or um, self-harm or anything. But all of a sudden, he starts saying, mom, my brain is telling me that to hurt myself, and if I didn't have a relationship with him, he would not have been able to tell me that. And so from that point on, we had an open conversation about how is he feeling? Can you listen on this? Do you have any uh, negative thoughts? Who would you tell those negative thoughts to? Why is it important? So relationships are huge, not only for your own kids, but for the kids that are in your classroom. My first year teaching, um, I taught in an EBD self-contained um, classroom, and one of my kiddos came in that day, and I could tell he was acting funny, that he was a middle schooler, and he just kept acting different, and I kept talking to him, and finally I said, what is going on? You're hiding something from me. And he brings out a knife and, and shows me this knife. And I said, why did you bring this knife to school? And what is going on? You need, you need to hand this over. We got administration involved. But he also talked to me. But I explained to him how this was really serious. And um, the bottom line was, is he was being threatened on the bus and he didn't feel safe. And so he brought it to protect himself. Um, but relationships matter, being able to notice when something is bothering the kids, being able to talk to them um, is huge. So what we do know too, there are research-based concepts that when you implement as part of your classroom management, it can improve students' behavior, their attitude, and motivation, and it's classroom management. So here are some four characteristics of a well-managed classroom. Um, high level of student involvement um, and in effective classroom, and this could hit home and just kind of think about your own. The teacher's working, but an effective classroom, the students are actually working. Um, another characteristic, clear student expectation. An ineffective teacher says, know everything in chapter three and be ready for the test tomorrow. A very effective teacher says, um, the reason that we're learning this in chapter three, and here's the study guide, and this is what it looks like, and we'll be having a test on this day. So that also goes along with posting it, sharing that information with them. Um, another characteristic, little wasted time, confusion, and or disruption. So an ineffective teacher punishes according to their mood. So when we say the teacher's mood um, kind of happens and that depends on that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, again, students will always ask what the assignment is and looking at that. So that teacher is punishing based on their mood and how they come in. An effective teacher, teacher has a disciplined plan and she posts an assignments and is much more consistent on a regular basis. Um, and another one is, number four, is that work oriented. And we've already talked about that. The teacher tells, but does not practice their procedures. Um, the teacher yells and flicks the light switch to try to get attention as we go through. Teacher practices procedures until they become routine and you know. So let's think back to the beginning of school in August or the beginning of the month 
have you gone over your rules for your routines, your procedures and all of that? And maybe it's time to go back over them. Even though it's April, getting ready to go in May, it's a perfect time coming back from spring break um, to be able to hit that or if you're getting new students in the classroom. Some basic beliefs about classroom management, it has a huge impact on student behavior that we should overtly teach it. And for middle school and high school, we think they should know. And what's most important is we have to realize that we still have to keep teaching them over and over and over, even at middle school and high school. Um, Teachers should focus more time and attention and energy on recognizing what kids are doing correctly than not. So currently, what I would say to you, it's April. We're tired. You're counting down. You're looking. Time to focus on what's going right in your classroom. Being very intentional about saying thank you very much, smiling at them, asking them, um, giving them, if you have bonus points, a token economy. Um, whatever that is, that you're paying much more attention to that than you are little Freddie over here on the side who is asleep or off task. Um, teachers should pre-plan the responses to misbehavior. And if you do so, you're much more calmer and you just very simply um, are able to give out the consequence without um, too emotional outbursts with that. You can use your phone to get this QR code for the based on time. We're not going to take this, but I would ask you to take it on your classroom that you're struggling with. Okay. Um, you could also click this link um, real quickly. I can, oh, I went into it. It's a, a classroom structure uh, level form and it will let you go through and see what level of structure your roughest or toughest class needs? Do they need a little bit? Do they need a um, medium structure or do they need high structure? So I highly recommend that you print that. I think it's it could be also in your file in your Google Doc. If not, Cindy, you might be able to go in here and post it into the chat. I'm not sure, but for time's sake, we're gonna go on. But I will hit on this. Depending on what structure, if you have a high structure classroom and you are a very low structure teacher, that is where a lot of your problems are coming from. So you can, if they are high structure, if they're low structure, they can function in a high structure classroom. So kind of keep that in mind as you go through. But what this is telling us to do is... For example, if you have a classroom that stresses you out and typically it's going to be that 61 to 120, you are going to provide a lot more reinforcement. You're going to have a lot more variety of um, ways to teach your lessons. So you're going to have a lot more movement and engagement activities with reinforcements in there. And they need to be given at a much um, higher frequency um, during that time. So that medium to high needs that a lot more. So out of your classroom, think about it. If you took your data and you looked at it for your own classroom, maybe it's that fifth hour class, that one o'clock that, um, that everybody has trouble, maybe after lunch, then we're going to have a very high structure classroom set up. And that is meaning that we have an agenda, we're going forward, we have a um, time timer in there to keep us focused. Along with them, we have much more reinforcement going through. In addition to that, we're going to look at expectations. There's absolutely no resource research Correlation between success of family background, the race, uh, financial status, um, even um, their, their ranking of educational background. However, the best correlation with success is attitude. So being able to teach that attitude, resiliency, um, how to overcome when they have failed at something, 
And obviously knowing what you can or cannot achieve is called expectations. What is classroom management? It's all the things that a teacher does to organize student space, time, and materials and to keep her classroom going. And this is the biggest struggle I know it's it's for you all is having, um, Cindy told me that having a classroom, of, I think you all cap your rooms at 10 kids. Sometimes that's tougher to manage 10 kids than it is 30 because you go back and you have low structure because you only have 10 kids, but you really, even though you have 10 kids, might need a high structure classroom, like what you would do to manage 30 kids. So that is really, really important. And sometimes it feels awkward because I've been there, small groups, even tutoring. I had to, <laughs> I'm also tutoring, a, I think he's first grade. He's really tall. So I keep thinking he's second, but I think he's first grade. And I have to keep going back to this level of um, structure. He was doing great. But when he came back from spring break, the first day of tutoring, my typical low structure with him, I needed high structure with him. And I had to be on him. I had to hold him accountable. I had to keep my stuff moving. And I had to have um, a variety of different lesson plans to be able to pull from to keep him on task. Um, but it was sunny. What happens when the um, daylight saving times occurs and the weather gets warmer? Our kids begin to lose a lot more focus. So we need more of that high structure. So keep that in mind. Organization. Um, our schedule, schedule of classroom rules, um, that you have an agenda up, that you mark it off. You can invite your kids to help you write it. You can have them mark it off. Um, if you're working in small groups, you can even put it on a smaller whiteboard or a poster, or you can write it on a um, piece of paper that keeps it at a table in a small group. Uh, that you're able to check it off. Um, physical space, we'll look at that. We'll quickly touch on um, attention signal, uh, beginning and ending routine, student work, and management plan. We're going to quickly, looking at our time, five ways to manage your classroom. You need to define procedures and routines. You have to teach it and practice it. Um, for a lot of our kids that have that mental health, learning disabilities, their vocabulary and processing time is so much different than the typical kid. And <clears throat> what I also noticed, though, even if they are what's considered the typical norm kid, like my oldest, does not have a disability. However, he hit teenage years and his brain is not necessarily always there. So um, teach them, practice it those procedures and routines. Go back of what you were doing at the beginning of the year, even currently, that you monitor the, that student behavior um, and you always anticipate if there's changes and to plan ahead. That daily schedule, monitor the length of activities that you have a kid on a computer. I think Ronnie mentioned earlier about sometimes it helps to get up and move. I know, um, Myself, there are times within my job that I sat at the computer, having a break and getting up and being able to walk definitely helps. Another thing is um, think about going to a PD. Could you sit here all day and do an online course? No, you probably couldn't. But when you go to an in-person uh, PD, even as adults, that you have a reasonable amount of answering in a chat box, um, that you have a video, that you have um, group work versus direct, that you have a little bit of me talking versus you talking. Um, so having that variety of activities and identify those times when those kids are gonna misbehave. Is it during group time? Is it during when you're talking? Posting your schedule. Um, you'll have a generic one, but also you can put out here your daily one and just mark it off so the kids know what's next. This is the biggest thing for middle school and high school. 
that can say the biggest advice, free time equals downtime is not good. You can structure your downtime or free time with something particular. So don't just let them say, oh, they're just gonna draw, set a timer, give them choices of what they're going to draw. If they get computer time, set a timer, tell them they can go on this software or this software. If they get free time to go for a walk or the gym, you set a timer and give them two different things to be able to do. Um, so, maintain a schedule in a daily agenda, free time versus downtime. Don't just allow them to do what they want to do without setting some structure or boundaries to it. I'm gonna quickly go over a couple more things. Um, we won't hit the videos, but you'll be able to um, watch the videos in your spare time. Um, and I highly recommend you do because it, they are based on secondary. So that middle school and high school, about teaching procedures and expectations in them. Um, they're huge. Physical space, making the room attractive and clean. Is your room clean? Are things out of sight? So they don't just come up to your desk and grab it and things that they're not supposed to be into. So storing those untouchables, that it's free of distractions, that you don't have too much up on the wall, but enough to focus. Another one are the fluorescent lights, um, maybe to have a couple of lights in there, or if you have the natural um, light to come in to turn off the overheads. Adding a little bit of carpeting helps reduce noise and uh, creates a little bit of warmth within a room. A lot of times you can get those donated or post on Facebook. Another one is check room temperature. This is huge, especially when temperatures are starting to go up like the last few days of 87, um, cold is better than warm. You can put on more layers, but you can't, you can only take off so much, but cold is better um, than warm to control behavior um, in the classroom. Um, the hotter you are, the hotter the temperature, okay? Or the temperament. So kind of keep that in mind. The colder, you're a little bit more chill. So it goes hand in hand. Physical space, again, arrange the desk where you're able to get through there. Um, having 10 kids, depending on how your classroom is set up, um, make sure that you get up and move, um, that you go and check on independent work, you check on the computer, what they're doing, you do some check-ins with them um, as you go through. I'm going to hit real quickly attention signal. It's huge. You need to have one even if you have 10 kids or if you have 20. I use it for adults all the time. Again, there's lots of things, but two important things. One, you need an auditory and you need um, a visual. So um, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to pause you there. Give me five something like that. A poor one is doing the lights out because you can't take it with you. Um, real quick, I went to Italy with a high school tour class and this was 15 years ago. And we were over in another country doing a tour and the, um, the tour guy goes, may I have your attention and had to wait for all of the teachers and students to stop talking and focus on him. Um, I have a couple of different examples of um, getting attention signals and a couple of different links in here for you and some actual videos that you'll be able to go through. I want to keep on going, but we use this. I use this for adults and having good beginning and ending routines. I'm going to hit on this and then I'll be able to let you go. But sometimes we lose a lot of um, instructional time in our classroom based on the beginning and ending routines of our classroom. And so with that being said, establishing those procedures of what they need to do when they come in are huge. Just to give you an idea, if you were to lose six minutes times seven periods, that's 42 minutes a day. That's 7,350 minutes a year. 
turns into hours, and then we turn that into days, we can lose instructional time by 17 and a half days per year by not having effective um, procedure and ending routines to our lesson end or day. There are a couple of different examples in here that you can go through and look at. Um, again, they are middle school, middle school and high school base. Give me just a second. I knew an hour was gonna be tough, but here is a really quick routines based on expectations in the classroom. You are to enter quietly. This is what you do. All of those um, work independently, any one of those things and what group work looks like. So as long as you have something posted, you go back over this with them numerous times. It's huge. And the other thing is rules. I do a lot of behavioral consulting. I go into classrooms from preschool to high school. And the one thing I do see, believe it or not, that's lacking even in 2024 are having our classroom rules up and posted. Uh, they need to be very few, not this many by all means. That's way too many rules. They need to be more procedures and routines at that point. But classroom rules, four of them is fine. Three, follow directions given the first time they're given. Be in the classroom and seated when the bell rings. Keep hands and feet to yourself. Use appropriate language. I do like the secondary one over hashtag or doing something with your rules like that um, to just make it a little bit more with it with the teenagers. Um, so kind of keep that in mind um, as you go through, but they need to be posted. One of the things that we did really well with during COVID is we had videos and teaching and pamphlets and handouts all on teaching um, about wearing masks and hand washing. And if we could teach all other expectations the same way that we did that, Think about it. They posted signs before you went into um, an office. Uh, they still are posting signs, however many years later. So those visual type things are the same thing that we need to do with our rules um, and about over overtly teaching them. So with that being said, I'm going to be mindful. I know that um, 11 o'clock we said for um, the time for today, Real quick, is there anything specifically that you all have a question over or that I could help answer before getting off? Or if you had more time, I could finish with a couple of other things. But if not, you can go back and review and look at the, the folder. Ronnie, Cindy, what are your thoughts here? I was trying to see how many. I really only had a couple of more sample of rewards and consequences and non-contingent attention. So I only have about. Ten to fifteen slides, but what are your thoughts, Karen? I think that I, I hope I appreciate all that you have shared with us. I think we probably need to be moving toward wrapping it up just to keep it within everybody's time frame because I know that other folks yes. are in schools, and so we want to make sure that they get back to what they need to be doing. Uh, okay. We did share the resources over in the chat section, though, so you can follow along with this and, and check out the other parts of it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I would go. Okay, anybody have any particular questions? Or anything that is happening currently in your classroom? I wanted to show you. Okay, 
if you needed a magic bullet right now, one of them would be the two ways to give student attention is really up your non-contention attention and positive feedback to the kiddos, especially when they're driving you crazy. This is the time to do it. And that would be the biggest bang for your buck currently is to greet them, speak to them, ask them all that non-contingent attention that um, needs to be upped um, and positive feedback when they are on task, when they're doing what they what you want. So that would be really looking at increasing your ratio of interactions with them would be one of the things that I would highly recommend from now to the end of May to get through in addition to all of the other areas there. So with that being said, you will have on here um, lots of different resources. Um, and so in your um, folder, there are tons. I'm not being able to there we go. I think um, Cindy or Katie shared that with you all. There is a ton of different resources available to help guide you through. And I believe that Katie and or Cindy has put in the evaluation along with your certificate. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. We appreciate okay. you spending this time week. with us. Oh, you I did great. I will do better next week with the um, non-compliance. By the way, non-compliance is my favorite. So <laughs> especially, I mean, I love it. Um, Get ready, but, folks. Yeah, so um, be ready for tons of resources, but I'll, I'll do much better on the time um, for next week as we go through. Perfect. And that next week is Wednesday, April 24th from yeah. 10 to 11 Eastern. Uh, same place. You can register on our website if you haven't registered already. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Thank you again, Karen. Katie, over in the chat box, put your resources as well as a link to complete uh, the evaluation for this session. And once you do that, you'll get your um, certificate for attending will be emailed to you directly from there. If you don't have an opportunity to do that, you can just email Katie. Uh, but we appreciate all of your time today. And thank you for staying a little bit over with us. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Karen.